Okay, well, as uh, representing the Daughters of Liberty, um, our activity started really quite early on in the middle of the 1700s. Uh, there had been many instances over our lifetimes where we were uh, limited in what we were allowed to make, what we were allowed to sell, what kind of produce that was allowed by the government, uh, whether we were allowed to raise our own sheep and keep our own wool and not send it to England. So there were many tactics that we took to avoid being suppressed or oppressed by the regulations of the government. Uh, one of the first had to do with wool. There was even in uh, the 1699 there was a wool act uh, and many acts after that that followed that really restricted our abilities. So we became quite crafty and in that, I mean, we learned how to raise our own sheep. Now, Great Britain only wanted white wool. They did not want any colored wool. And if you consider yourself to be a small, on the fringe of society farmer, uh, with access to the woods, it might have been quite handy if you once in a while had a black sheep born to your flock. Now, this is what a black lamb, this is a black lamb skin. This is what the color of a black lamb would be. And now it looks very much the same color as a bear. And in the woods, if you had a small little um, pasture or a little corral in the woods, your sheep would not be detected by anyone passing by. They would be safe. Another place that sheep were hidden were out on the islands. And there are some heritage flocks that are still preserved out on the islands because they had no uh, way of wandering off. They were not accessed by the Indians. Uh, they were not preyed upon by some of the big predators like cats. Uh, and they weren't uh, taken by the neighbors or the uh, colonial infantry as they were coming through. Uh, so having colored sheep in your flock was a serious advantage. Now, there's also an advantage of having the colored wool. It's nature's camouflage. So by the time the French and Indian War came along, and we were busy making items that would be worn by our menfolk, we were, uh, we were privileged to have a natural fiber that we could make from scratch to uh, camouflage our husbands as they went out. This is uh, one of the first items of wear. This is a cap uh, called a Monmouth cap. The Monmouth cap was actually uh, on the passenger list for the Mayflower. Mm. And for the passengers of the Puritans, they were all required to have one of these Monmouth caps as an essential item of wear. If you think back to the times when there were metal helmets, they were the, this was the cushioning under the metal helmet. And it just maintained its popularity throughout the times. Uh, it eventually evolved into a sailor's cap that, where they turned up the edges, and now this looks more like the modern sailor's cap. However, this Monmouth cap is made out of a natural gray wool um, that would not make the wearer at all visible if he were hiding in the trees. It has a double band that is knitted into the cap to keep your ears warmer and to also not cup over your eyes but to give you a sunshade. If you can imagine sighting in a rifle into the sun, you would not want to have the sun glaring straight into your eyes. So this was one of the first items of interest of the colon of the women folk of the colonies to learn to make. Uh, you know, it's also it's knit 20% larger and then washed in hot water and soap and felted. So it's especially dense. Now the next item that they would have found useful in the earlier times when uh, people were not necessarily confined to the cities, uh, this is these are a pair of fingerless mitts, and these were for, made for a man who would go out in the woods. These fingerless mitts are made out of wool, and again, natural colored wool. So you're not flashing anything white around in the breeze when you're doing your work in the woods. It's also very thick and felted as well to keep your hands warm. Um, when you don't need your fingers, a regular pair of mitts, these are indigo dyed color, um, these regular mitts, and of course are worn enough on the thumb to have uh, uh, just survived, but that can be darned. They, uh, what, mitts keep your fingers warmer by having the fingers together. And these are wool, 
Um, they could also be knit larger and every time they're washed they shrink a little, they get more compact, they fit the hand better and they're windproof and it, with the lanolin in the wool uh, they are almost waterproof. So another item that would be worn more by the ladies in the household, these are wool, hand spun, hand knit. These would not have been natural color, this was a white wool that was dyed indigo. And this is called indigo exhaust. The dye was repeatedly used and each time a successive dye batch went, it became a little lighter. So these are hand spun and hand dyed and it left your fingers free. Um, had a little bit around the thumb, but your fingers are free to do housework and any other chores that the women needed to do. They would be worn outside or inside because of the cold weather. There was often ice on the inside of the houses uh, and so mitts like this were worn uh, on a daily basis in the winter. Now, the way these things were knit were on needles in the round. All of them are knit in the round. They didn't go back and forth and they were knit on needles that are about this big around and you just keep going round and round and round. Knitting was just straight knitting. There wasn't uh, the variety of stitches that were used as time went on. It was just straight knitting. Uh, for hats, for mitts, and, and for socks. Everything was knit in the round. Even by the middle of the 1700s there were hand cranked knitting machines for knitting the fine socks but not so for things that needed to be warm and, and had lots of bulk. It's actually much more efficient to knit things heavier. And that is because um, it takes time. From the time you take the wool off the sheep to the time it gets ready to knit, every process takes time. And the thinner the yarn, the more stitches it takes. So if you knit something with a heavy yarn that is fairly thick, you could knit a pair of these in just a few hours. Uh, whereas something that is finer knit, like these ladies' mitts, would take several days to knit. Efficiency was the name of the game. There was, um, there was tale of a family where the husband was needing to go off to battle and he did not have the proper suit of clothes. Most of the men folk before uh, the organization of the Continental Line did not have any supplies that were provided to them by the government. Everything they owned had to be supplied by their own families. So the women folk of the family got busy and in 48 hours they sheared the sheep, they spun it, they made the clothes, and the husband in 48 hours had a suit of clothes to go off to war. That means also probably that they had quite a few children. So families were big and little children would start at a very early age working with the wool. Now this is a basket here of wool. This is how the wool comes off the sheep. As you can see, if uh, it's close enough, you can see that there are locks of wool. And this has been washed, but you can do this even without washing the wool. Over here you see the little curly ends of the wool, and it has quite a nice wave to it. So, the children, from the beginning, once the wool comes off the sheep, they might be in charge of picking the wool, which just means separating the wool locks so that they are not stuck together. And that's wool picking. And their wool picking can be done uh, by the fireside, you don't need any special place to do it, and so this was a family activity for children who are very young. And that could be maybe even four to six years old. So picking the wool um, is something that it doesn't have any element of danger to it. The next stage of, uh, of processing wool in order to make yarn to knit with requires um, a pair of hand cards. And the hand cards are right here. The hand cards are beds of fine needles that have a little bend to them. And they are not to be handled by those who want to bash their sisters and brothers. They might be, um, by the time a child might be six or seven, they would be taught to use the hand cards. So the way the wool is put on the hand cards is it's just placed on the hand cards from the wool that has been picked. And as you can see, 
um, it's quite an unorderly a mess. And then you just slowly take oh, the other hand card across the wool in a very uh, simple way. And it doesn't take much effort. You don't even have to do it twice. You've seen people who transfer it back and forth between the hand cards many times. It depends on how fine and how neat you want to be and how quickly you have to make a garment. So for instance, if this is what I have, and I did that in about, what, five seconds, I can roll it up sideways, or I can roll it up longwise. So I'm gonna take this, and I'm just gonna take it as it is off the cards, and I'm gonna show you how to spin it. So this is just um, a fairly loose mass of fleece, and if you look here at the spinning wheel, this is called the distaff. The distaff can be used for either wool or flax. And in another video, we will do flax. But making the wool, carding it the way I just did, and then laying it out into a big mat and wrapping it around the distaff gives you a huge reservoir of wool that you can draw off of for quite a long time. So now, sitting down, this wheel is a, a, a wheel that would have been characteristic of uh, some of the Swedish immigrants or Scandinavian immigrant, immigrants who came to this country. It is a, a style that has two benches. Many of the other wheels have only one bench, but they all work the same. The only thing the wheel is responsible for doing is twisting the yarn. And by using your foot on the treadle, you make the wheel go around and it spins the metal spindle which twists the yarn. Then as it spins, I have two drive bands. One goes over the storage device, the bobbin. And this is what the bobbins look like. The bobbins are removable. You put one on and it's your storage device. Once you have several bobbins full, you can use several bobbins and spin them back together to make a yarn that has more than one strand in it, like this or like this one, this would be a typical knitting yarn. It would be a two-ply, it would have two strands of yarn. So you need a bobbin each to make a two-ply. So I would fill up two bobbins and then spin them backwards together. So for making this wheel work, I take off my shoe and it's simply, I'm starting it spinning and I just touch the wool down, and as the wool twists, I draw back, and I can make the yarn either thin or thick, depending on what kind of a garment I'm making. So very often, what a woman would do would be to spin a length of yarn, which I will do, and then ply it back on itself and set it alongside the wheel to serve as an example to remind her exactly how thick the yarn should be spun when it is uh, when she's gone away and come back. Or if somebody else sits down to the wheel and starts to spin, it will tell them that this is what we were spinning, and this is the size, and this is the fiber. Um, there's really no uh, criteria. All the wool that is spun can be used for something, and it is not a problem. Now, uh, see, I'm, I'm spinning quite a while here, and of that little bit that I just carded, off of a lock, straight off the sheet, I still have quite a ways to go. So I'm going to stop here just for show. So now I'm going to pull this back off the wheel and I'm going to show you. Um, this is what would happen if I took two strands of this yarn. I'm going to go back to where I started. These are, these are two strands of yarn that I've just spun. And now I'm going to let these two yarns twist around each other. And if you notice, they're just going to curl right back up. And I just keep pulling down a little bit. Just pulling down. And this is only an example of how a two-ply yarn becomes a knitting yarn. You would take two bobbins full and run them back onto the wheel going the opposite direction to get this two-ply yarn. And now this yarn is just like this yarn that I'm knitting with.